mine tunnel that goes through two hard rock mine claims. The Eagle Mine, the High Peak Mine. These two mine claims uh, would have been separate um, back in 1870 when they started, all the way through 1934 when they um, went out of business. Now, today we're going to walk right through one into the other and out the side of the mountain over there and come back down the road. So that gives us this one way tour through the mountain. Well, back during the time these were actively mined, there would have been about a 40 foot rock wall that separated the two claims. That made sense because it had two different owners the whole time. And mm -hmm. so we want folks from claim A wandering around on claim B or vice versa. Well, <coughs> how did these uh, two mines get joined together? It might be reasonable to think that when the tour started, they just blasted out the wall and uh, made them connected. But that's not actually the case. Um, you see, in 1934, mining ended, and this uh, property here was vacant, abandoned mine sites for about 25 years until 1967 when a gentleman named Edwin Sprague bought the tour, or bought the property and set up this mine tour. So this has been a tour for about uh, 50 years. Well, Mr. Sprague noticed in 1967 that uh, the rock wall that separated the two mines had been um, taken out, and all the rail track had been removed from both of the mine claims. Anyone have an idea why that might have been? Worm? Yep. Uh, 1942 to 1943, there was a uh, shortage of iron, iron recycling um, went on, and these were abandoned mine sites, the Julian Mining District, as well as others, uh, which were abandoned, were um, very good sources of iron, and in fact, the best iron being the rail track in the mine claim. The rail track's uniform, easy to transport, it's protected from elements inside the claim, and it does not have to be remelted down and recast be used. There are I-beams that can be used in equipment, so it can simply be repurposed to get out of a substantial step in the iron recycling effort. And so the government came in, removed all the rail track as well as the rock wall. The rock wall went because if you look at this tunnel here, you'll see it's pretty tall and pretty wide. Well, the high peak tunnel is your typical mine tunnel, which is not necessarily tall and wide. It's shorter and narrower, and if you're taking 20 foot long segments of rail track out, you'd like to come out to a tall wide tunnel. And so they knew that there was a 40 foot rock wall separating the two claims, they just blasted it out, and they took all of the rail track out this bigger, wider Eagle tunnel. You'll get the experience firsthand, that high peak tunnel on the way out, um, and you'll see what a difference um, there is. Now, let me tell you a little bit about um, what you would have to do here to be a mine owner and stay in business. The gold is going to come out of the mountain in an ore called quartz. There's lots of examples of quartz on this ledge right here. You can see that rock is a lot different from the rock most of the mountain's made out of. 96, 8% of the mountain's made out of this rock right here. This gray rock called schist, Julian schist. It's a nice rock, but it doesn't really have any gold associated with it. All the gold is going to be in the quartz. Now, if you're looking to set up a mine, you need to find a quartz vein in this mountain and it's going to be the minority of the rock. Well, you're going to have to crush a lot of rock to make pro make it profitable because the we have down here what's called a low-grade ore. It means we have about <coughs> an ounce to an ounce and a half of gold per ton of rock. And that means you're going to have to do about, well, as much as you can every day to stay in business. There's a machine that would help you out, that red machine on the other side of that building. For those of you who haven't seen it yet, it's a rock crusher stamp mill. You crush up to 10 tons of rock a day. You just had to keep it loaded with quartz, so you'd have to find a substantial quartz vein. How would you go about doing that? Well, to do a little bit about how the mountains were formed, it could be helpful. Back thousands of years ago when the mountain range was formed, it was a continental and oceanic plate that were pushing together. Each of these plates had layers of rock, horizontal layers of rock called strata on them. Each, uh, most of the strata were made of the schist, but occasionally there would be a quartz strata in this first, and when these mountains formed, those horizontal layers pushed up together to form vertical layers of rock, kind of like slices of bread and a slice of loaf of bread. Now, most of those slices are going to be shift, but occasionally you'll find the quartz slice in that loaf. Now, there's one thing these strata have in common. Basically, they run from the base mountain all the way to the surface where they're covered with a thin layer of topsoil. They run for miles in this direction and this direction with the mountain range. So if you're looking for a quartz stratum, what you would do is you'd hike up to the surface of the mountain looking for what's called the quartz outcropping. That's an exposed area of quartz. 
where the wind and the rain has eroded the soil away to leave this exposed rock. And when you find some exposed quartz, you now sweep away the topsoil in this direction, this direction, for a few feet, verifying that you really have the top edge of a quartz stratum. And when you see that, you're interested in one thing, what is the width of that quartz stratum where you're at with that quartz outcrop? Well, if it's less than a foot wide, you're probably not going to be successful at keeping that rock crushing with that quartz. But if it's a foot or more wide, you might want to set up a mine site there. Well, in 1870, a guy named Sunmire was hiking on this mountain, high peak, right at the top of the middle of the mountain. He found a two-foot wide outcropping of quartz, twice as big as most everybody else was finding. And he was very happy about that. So he sets up and towns a high peak mine around that quartz outcropping. And he goes to town every day for about a month and brags about it in the bar. So big his uh, quartz outcropping was that he found here on high peak. And for a month, a guy named Billy Moran listens to these stories about how big this outcropping is. He decides he's going to come up to High Peak and look for a three foot wide outcropping. Well, he doesn't find one that's three foot wide, but he does find three that are at least a foot wide. And he sets up the Eagle Mine right next to the High Peak Mine around these three course outcroppings. When you lease the mineral rights from the government, you pay $200 a year and you get a rectangle of space 600 feet wide by 1,500 feet long. That 1,500 foot length would run parallel to your quartz main. Now, these two rectangles were set up um, around the High Peak Bay and the Eagle and Star veins and the Hayden vein, the three veins Mr. Moran found. There are two adjacent rectangles um, abutting each other, and that's why there was that 40 foot rock wall separating the two claims. Come a little closer to the um, entryway here. I'll tell you a little more about a few things that we'll head down the middle. Now, there's a technical name for a mine entryway, for those of you that don't know. The mining term for a mining entrance is called an adit. A D I D. That's a term I'd like you to be familiar with, adit. And while we're here at the end, let me show you a couple of things. First of all, when you come to work every day in 1870, this is what it looks like. It's pretty dark. And how would you find your way to where you needed to go? In the mine. Well, we have electric lights today, so we're going to use those. <laughs> in 1870, they would have a kerosene lantern and one of these fancy setups. E uh, headwear with a candle reflector. This will get you where you need to go, believe it or not. But it's not the most convenient source of light. And it's not easy to work wearing one of these um, <laughs> setups. Now, the tool most commonly associated with mining is the pick. This here is a modern day pick. You can see um, the design of this pick versus the 1870s pick. The 1870s pick, which is a little bit larger, also has a design feature that makes it easy to repair the single bolt and nut, which attaches this two piece iron head to the wooden handle. These would break all the time, they get dull, they're hitting it against very hard rock. And so they needed to be able to repair these easily. This one here, you typically just go down to Home Depot and buy a new one if you break it. <laughs> they didn't have Home Depot back then. They wouldn't uh, go down there. They did. They didn't have the money to buy these tools new all the time. They needed to repair them. So there'd be a blacksmith shop, typically, uh, typically outside of the mine, where there'd be a blacksmith working pretty much all day to keep these tools in good repair. Also at the end of here, you'll find a board um, at most mines. Um, this is called a uh, the CHIT system, C-H-I-T, CHIT. Each of these medallions here are called CHITs. And a miner, uh, well, there would be one for each miner in your crew. So if you had eight miners, which was your average size mine crew, there would be eight CHITs hanging on the board. The miner would take his CHIT into the mine with him every day when he goes into the mine and hang it back up when he comes out. And at the end of the day, the mine foreman and mine owner can come to the attic simply count the chits on the board to make sure everybody's accounted for. If there are chits missing, then he needs to gather up the rest of the miners, and they go into the mine and look for anybody who might be injured or missing. Now, the only problem with this system is pretty much foolproof, easy to use. The only problem comes around when the new miner's down at the bar drinking later that night and <coughs> goes to pay his tab. He pulls this out of his pocket, and he now realizes why the rest of his miner friends are there at the bar drinking with him that night. Well, they were in the mine searching for him all night. So on the way home, he... Uh, wonders if he has any friends anymore. <laughs> well, when he goes to the uh, attic to hang his chin on the board, the next morning he'll find out that they're all waiting for him outside the attic. It's probably not a good sign. <laughs> now, you might wonder why we have rail track today. Well, that's because Mr. Sprague in 67, when he started this mine tour, he had to relay all this rail track because he wanted it to be authentic. But he did get that rock wall blasted out for him, so I guess there was some benefit to that exercise. Now, if you look at the rail track, notice that it goes up a slight hill going into the mine, comes down that same slight hill coming out. There's a reason for that. It's a common design feature of all 1800s hard rock mines. You see, 
The orange heart that you push in is empty. When this uh, push down is full of rock, mm -hmm. you want to be going downhill on the way out. If you are doing this backwards um, as a mine owner, you probably won't stay in business very long. You won't be able to keep a mine crew pushing ore carts full of rock up the hill on the way out. So what I'd like you to do is follow me down about 50 feet, and we'll be at the eagle. <coughs> come through what we call a cross-cut tunnel. It's called a cross-cut tunnel because we're cleaning across those layers of try to schist to get to the quartz vein. <coughs> and they would make about four feet a day cutting this tunnel. They would use explosives, black powder, uh, in the case of the miners back in 1870. Dynamite wasn't perfected until 1915, so black powder was the best choice. And four feet a day would take about two weeks to get from the entryway of the out of there to this point. Let me show you where the quartz vein is by putting my flashlight beam at the ceiling. I'm going to start at a layer of schist or start at a schist right about here. See how it's a nice gray start with schist right there. There's another one here and here. Look what happens right now. We get to a white sort of tannish rock. See that um, single band of rock there that's a uh, whitish tan. It goes back to gray, 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 gray. So that's our special slice of bread and our slice of loaf of bread to run with raisins in it. It was schist all the way from the beginning to right here. And then it continues on just afterwards. This is about a 15 inch wide um, quartz uh, vein. And it would have been at that outcropping on the surface where Mr. Moran initially found it, it would have been about 15 inches wide there, too. It doesn't vary in width as you go down. It does, however, vary in width as you go along the length of the vein. As you can see, it's about 15 inches wide here, but if you follow my flashlight down, following the vein, you see that it's getting narrower, narrower. It gets very restricted right here. And as you go down this tunnel, you'll see that it gets wide again, and it stays wide on the length of that tunnel for quite some ways. Now, these tunnels that go off of the crosscut tunnel, this way and this way, they're called drift tunnels. They're called drift tunnels because you're drifting with the quartz vein in the direction that's most economically advantageous to mine. That means where it's the thickest. Now, we already know we found a region that's over a foot wide. As we go down this way further, what happened here? This tunnel is only 15 feet long. They stopped mining after 15 feet because it got narrow and stayed narrow. So they didn't want to continue to uh, maintain the effort it requires to um, mine the quartz out of it when that vein was very thin. Now, this direction, it got a little bit narrow right here, but it got wide real quick again, and it stayed wide for 100 feet. So they continued to mine the quartz um, down this way for 100 feet. And at the end of that 100-foot tunnel, you would have seen the vein started shrinking down and got narrow, stayed narrow for quite some time, about 300 feet. Well, there's something you can do in this case. You stop mining um, in any event because you don't want to waste your resources. But you can go back up to the outcropping, you know where it is on the surface of the mountain. You follow it along. You keep clearing away the topsoil, go through the part where it's um, not as wide, and hopefully it'll get wider again when it gets wide. And if it stays wide, you can cut a new at it and mine the vein discontinuously as long as you're on your plane. And so that's what they did with the Eagle Vein here, and um, they did that with other veins, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. The photograph that we have here shows a picture of Mr. Moran. He's the founder of the Eagle Mine. That's where he lived in that cabin. You can see that that's not an elaborate house or anything. Um, the Eagle Mine was the number five producing mine in the district of over 200 mining claims. The high peak was number four, yet these guys weren't living large. Why? Well, it's that low-grade ore. When you have um, such a low-grade ore, you um, really don't um, become a millionaire. You um, do, however, if you're um, a, a prudent business owner and you um, have a good workforce, you can stay in business. And what he can say is he was able to be self-sufficient and um, hire eight uh, miners at high-paying uh, wage-paying jobs. Now, the wages for miners would be $2 a day back then. That was twice as much as everybody else who got paid one dollar a day if you were lucky enough to have a job. What uh, the gold rush meant uh, down here in Julian was 64 years of high wage paying jobs for someone who was physically willing and able to do the labor. You didn't have to have a skill, you didn't have to have an education, 
But as long as you can do the physical labor, you can be a minor, and you 